welcome to this video on enzymes. First, we will start off by looking at the question, what are enzymes? Enzymes are known as biological catalysts, meaning they speed up the rate of chemical reactions without being used up in the process. Enzyme action can be both intracellular and extracellular. meaning they can catalyse reactions inside and outside of cells. Enzymes are globular proteins with a tertiary structure. They have a special site known as an active site into which the substrate molecule fits. The highly specific tertiary structure of each enzyme determines the shape of the active site and therefore only certain substrate molecules are complementary and can fit. You can usually recognise the name of an enzyme because they often end in A's. For example, lactase. Now, let's take a look at activation energy. This is defined as the energy required to start a reaction. In other words, to break existing bonds so that new bonds can form. Activation energy is usually pr provided in the form of heat. Enzymes lower the activation energy. This is essentially how they speed up chemical reactions. There are a few ways in which they can do this. Firstly, they can hold molecules closer together, reducing repulsion so they can bond more easily. Secondly, fitting into the active site puts the strain on the bonds in the substrate so it breaks up more easily. Thirdly, enzymes can make local conditions inside the active site very different from those outside, for example, pH. So the reaction is more likely to happen. Here, I have drawn an energy versus time graph to show how enzymes lower the activation energy of a reaction pathway. Scientists used to use the lock and key model to describe enzyme action. Basically, they thought that the substrate fits into the enzyme's active site the same way a key fits into a lock. This assumes that the shape of the active site is rigid. Here is a diagram to show this model. However, more recently, the induced fit model has come about. This model suggests that the active site is flexible and only assumes its catalytic conformation after the substrate molecules bind to the site. After the product leaves the enzyme, the active site reverts to its original shape. The induced fit model helps to explain why enzymes are so specific and only bond to one particular substrate, because not only does the substrate have to be the right shape to fit into the active site, it must make the active site change in the right way as well. This is why the induced fit model is more widely accepted. Rate of reaction, otherwise known as ROR, is really important when discussing enzymes. You can measure rate of reaction by either looking at the appearance 
of a product over time or the disappearance of a reactant over time. Hence, rate of reaction graphs usually look like this. With time on the x-axis and the appearance of product or the disappearance of reactant on the y-axis. The initial ROR is the rate of reaction at the start of the reaction when time equals zero, i.e. here. To work out the initial rate of reaction, you need to draw a tangent to the curve at time equals zero. Then you need to calculate the gradient of your straight line by doing the difference in y divided by the difference in x. Then calculate the units by doing the y units divided by the x units. So in this case, it would be centimetres cubed per second. This method can be used to calculate rate of reaction on other points of the graph as well. Now we will take a look at some factors that affect the rate of enzyme controlled reactions, starting with temperature. This is a graph that shows temperature against rate of reaction. It shows that initially, as temperature increases, rate of reaction increases. This is because an increase in temperature provides more heat energy. This gives both enzyme and substrate more kinetic energy. Therefore, they move faster. This results in more successful collisions between enzyme active sites and substrate molecules. So more enzyme substrate complexes are formed per unit time. Examiners love to ask questions about how factors such as temperature affect rate of enzyme controlled reactions, and this is the level of detail you need to provide in order to gain full marks. If we look back at the graph, we can see that the rate of reaction peaks here in the middle. This is known as the optimum temperature the temperature at which the enzyme works best. As the temperature increases beyond the optimum, we can see that the rate of reaction begins to decline rapidly and then it stops completely. This is because at high temperatures, enzyme and substrate have lots of kinetic energy, so vibrate more. This causes the bonds holding the tertiary structure of the enzyme to break, which causes a change in shape of the enzyme and its active site. Therefore, the substrate can no longer fit into active site, so enzyme substrate complexes can no longer form. Since the enzyme can no longer function as a catalyst, it is said to be denatured at this point here. pH can also affect the rate of enzyme controlled reactions. The graph looks very similar to the temperature graph. Up at the top is the optimum pH at which the enzyme works best. Most human enzymes have an optimum pH of 7. However, there are exceptions. For example, pepsin in the stomach works best at pH 2. 
above and below the optimum, rate of reaction decreases. This is because the H plus and OH minus ions found in acids and alkalis can mess up with the ionic and hydrogen bonds that hold the enzyme's tertiary structure in place by altering the charges on the amino acids that make up the active site. Therefore, this changes the shape of the active site. So the substrate is no longer complementary. So enzyme substrate complexes can't form. At extreme pH values, enzymes will denature. Another factor to consider is enzyme concentration. Here is a graph that demonstrates it nicely. As enzyme concentration increases, rate of reaction increases up to a certain point. This is because there are more enzymes, so more active sites. So it is more likely a substrate molecule will collide with an enzyme. Therefore, more enzyme substrate complexes are formed per unit time. In this part of the curve, enzyme concentration is known as the limiting factor. It is the one limiting rate of reaction. We know this because as we increase enzyme concentration, we increase the rate of reaction. However, after a certain point, the rate of reaction levels off. This is because all substrate molecules have formed enzyme substrate complexes. So increasing enzyme concentration makes no difference. Here, the limiting factor is substrate concentration. The last factor that can affect rate of reaction is substrate concentration. The graph looks very similar to that of enzyme concentration. Initially, as substrate concentration increases, so does rate of reaction. This is because you have more substrate molecules, so there is a greater chance of collision with an enzyme. Therefore you have more successful collisions and therefore more enzyme substrate complexes formed per unit time. Here the limiting factor is the substrate concentration. However then a saturation point is reached where all enzymes active sites are occupied and enzymes are acting at their maximum turnover rate. So adding more substrate will make no difference. This causes the rate of reaction to stay constant. Here, the enzyme concentration is the limiting factor. Lastly, let's talk about competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Enzyme inhibitors are basically substances that directly or indirectly interfere with the functioning of an enzyme's active site. Competitive inhibition involves molecules that are a similar shape to substrate. They compete with the substrate molecules for available active sites, blocking them off so substrate molecules cannot bind. Here is a diagram to show it. 
It is important to note that competitive inhibitors do not permanently bind to the active sites, but rather pop in and out. So it's temporary. This means that if you increase substrate concentration, you can increase the rate of reaction because with more substrate molecules, you increase the chances of su the substrate molecules reaching an active site before an inhibitor. This graph helps to demonstrate. Here is the rate of reaction with no inhibitor, and here is the rate of reaction with an inhibitor. As you can see, you still reach the peak rate of reaction, it just takes longer to get there. Non-competitive inhibitors do not bind to the active site, but instead bind to an enzyme's allosteric site away from the active site. This causes the active site to change shape. So the substrate molecules are no longer complementary. This diagram demonstrates it nicely. Here you've got the non-competitive inhibitor binding to the allosteric site. This has changed the shape of the active site so it's no longer complementary to this substrate. So that cannot bind and the reaction cannot be catalyzed. Unlike competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors usually have a different shape to the substrate. Also, they bind permanently. This means that even if you increase substrate concentration, the rate of reaction will not change as enzyme activity will still be inhibited. This is a graph with no inhibitor, and this is a graph with a non-competitive inhibitor. Even when you increase substrate concentration, you're not increasing the rate anymore. It's just staying flat. Thank you for watching. I hope you found it useful.